to talk about um, scaling Python application. So at, at NERSC, I'm in, I work in the data services and data analytics and services group. And one of the primary things I do is, is help our Python users use Python on the NERSC supercomputers and in particular, kind of think about scaling challenges and using the GPUs on Perlmutter. So when I started at NERSC, actually as a postdoc, I was working with uh, Desi and uh, porting their science <coughs> um, their science uh, code processes um, data from a telescope in Arizona, um, and uh, it's all implemented in Python. So I was helping port that over to use the GPUs at NERSC. So on the left here, I have kind of an example um, uh, plot showing the speed up over time of porting that code over to the GPU. So the very first kind of benchmark I did, the first GPU port down there is considerably worse performance than the CPU version, but kind of over time, kind of just continuing to, to work on it, we we're able to achieve over a 25x speed up compared to a baseline. So there's a lot of caveats in that, but anyway, I just want to demonstrate that it, it can be done. Um, and then on the right, so after we kind of did that, that work, um, so that was kind of porting a, just a single step of the data processing over to use GPUs. Then we wanted to kind of test out Perlmutter and see uh, what sort of scales can we run this code on Perlmutter and what sort of issues would we run into on the way. So on the right, I have an example plot of scaling the DESI pipeline code, which is all implemented in, in Python up to use the entire full system of, of Perlmutter. So I also add a little asterisk there, because again, there's a lot of caveats there, but these slides just demonstrate that this can be done. You can move your code over to the GPUs and you can run at, at the entire scale of, of the Perlmutter. Um, so <clears throat> to get started, we're actually gonna take a lot of steps back and just look at a very simple problem um, and kind of use this as an example to think about parallelism in Python and kind of consider different options. So this is a very common example of just using a Monte Carlo method to estimate the value of pi. So on the left here, kind of have a, a Python implementation of that function. Um, and we draw random samples in X and Y position. And if those X and Y positions are within this quarter circle, then we, we count, we, we increment a counter. And then at the end, once we've generated all the samples we wanna use, we, we estimate a value, value of pi by computing the ratio of counts that were inside that little quarter circle to the outside. And that gives us a Monte Carlo estimation of pi. Um, and then so some terms in the next few slides I'll, I'll probably use many times. So I just wanna maybe throw this out there. Um, so when I say a, a program, a program is a collection of instructions that a computer will execute. So we could sort of think about that, that file there, that library.py, that's, that's kind of like our program. It's not quite the case for Python, but a process is an instance of that program that is being executed and that can contain one or more threads. And a thread is an, a unit of execution within a process. And typically threads within a process can share state and memory. Um, so if we have, a, a, if we want to run this, this code, so we have a, a serial version of this um, code. So this is just a single threaded um, version. So there's no parallelism here. Um, so we have our, our serial version, pi dash serial dot. Um, and so we import our, our function from our library. We say we want to generate 20 million samples and we run, we, we run the pi estimation code. We also um, measure the time um, that it takes. So if we look at this simple example, it takes about three and a half seconds. Um, and what's happening here is when we run Python, pass the file name, we start up the Python interpreter. So the Python interpreter is the real program. It takes in our file, translates that into Python bytecode, and then passes those instructions um, and those instructions get executed at runtime. And so one thing to point out here is that Python is slower because it's interpreted at runtime. It's slower than compiled languages like C or C++ or Fortran. Um, but it's a very popular language and developers like it because they feel more productive and it's easier to use than some of those compiled languages. So this is the world that we're working in. And just to give you a, a kind of an order of magnitude, Benchmark. I implemented a C version of this, and it's it's about ten times faster um, than this simple example here. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, but on the bright side, you know, people are still working on Python, the language. And so Python 3.11 was um, released just a few days ago and it's, it's getting faster. So I, I noticed this in the kind of release notes for the, the new Python uh, version. It's, they say it's about um, 10 to 60% faster than the previous version. And I, I tested this on our simple code and it is a lot faster. And as my colleague, Lori Steffi likes to say, green speed up is the best speed up. So that's encouraging for, for Python developers. Um, okay, so the first parallelism example that we wanna look at is kind of multi-threading. Um, so one issue with parallelism in Python is that multi-threading is, is not really helpful for compute bound tasks like our simple um, Pi estimation thing. And that's because of this thing called the global interpreter lock. And so we can't really get into the details of that here, but this example just shows a case where we create multiple threads. So here creating four threads, and I give each of those threads a portion of the work to do. So I'm giving it a quarter, each thread gets a quarter of those um, number of samples to generate. Um, and then we start our benchmark. We say start equals time to time. And then the threads actually launch uh, using when that start method is called for each thread. And then the main process thread um, keeps going as, as it launches each of those other threads and, it, and then it won't wait for those threads to, to finish until you call the join, join method on that. Um, and so we notice when we run this program, it's actually slightly slower than this completely serial version. And that's again, because of this global interpreter lock that doesn't help us. So multi-threading is typically not gonna help you in Python. There are some cases though, where it does help. So if you have non-compute bound things, so things like IO, if you're like waiting for a file system IO operation or something like that, multi-threading can help in that case. So this, this is just a quick example of just showing for um, a case where multi-threading can actually help, but most people aren't just calling sleep in their scientific <laughs> data processing code. Workflow managers sleep while. The workflow managers, yeah. Okay. So for things like like web servers and stuff, like there are use plenty of valid use cases out there in the, in the wild where multi-threading is helpful. Um, and then looking further beyond the current release of Python, well, I noticed one of the goals in the, the next for the next version of Python is actually developing some work around this multi-threaded parallelism. So that's also encouraging. <clears throat> Another popular uh, parallelism framework in, in Python that comes with the, the standard Python library is, is multiprocessing. So in, in multiprocessing, now is we kind of bypass that um, the GIL, the global interpreter lock, by spawning up separate processes. And so those processes can um, run in parallel and, and make progress. So, so, so here I have a simple example, uh, again, a, a version of our program where we start up four new processes using the multiprocessing pool um, method. And then again, we pass each of them a quarter of the work. And now we see, we do see a, a good speed up here. Not quite a factor of four, but, but close to a factor of four. Um, and then I also just wanted to highlight the, the way those processes start up, um, it can vary. Um, I'm demonstrating that using the spawn method, which is not the, the default method on, on Linux systems, um, because it's a little more composable with the MPI, um, um, using MPI on, on HPC systems. Um, so speaking of, so MPI, MPI um, stands for the message processing, message processing interface. And it's really just, it's a, it's a standard which defines a set of library functions um, that facilitate inter-process communication. So one thing I was kind of cheating in those the last two examples is I didn't really collect the results from each of those separate processes or threads and try to combine them. And I did a very just simple, um, you know, telling each thread or process how much work to do. I didn't like pass a lot of data. So MPI really, I think, gives the, the, the user like a, a common set of functions that they could use for, for sharing data between processes. And in Python, we could use MPI for Pi, which builds on top of that um, specification and provides an, an interface where you can just pass, 
pickleable um, Python objects and, and things like NumPy arrays to those collective um, or commu those communication functions. Um, so here's an example using MPI for Py um, in Python. So <clears throat> one thing that's that's different about this, if you notice our, our execution command here, we have this s run dash n4 Python. So now we have something external to the Python interpreter that we use to launch our program. And so that, that launcher launches um, four processes um, and those processes sync up during the MPI initialization um, when your uh, processes, when they're all, each of them are executing. So, and here it happens in that line from MPI for Py, import Py, all of those processes kind of sync up and they figure out how they're gonna communicate with each other. Um, and so <clears throat> you have this communicator object now, which you can use. So, so here we're, again, we're not doing very, very much, um, this is a very, pretty simple example, but the, those com dot barriers are saying, are ma making sure each of those processes are in sync before the next, before they move on to the next bits of, um, uh, instructions in their process. So here again, we see a pretty good, good speed up. Um, another uh, very popular parallelism framework for Python is, is Dask. Um, so Dask is a very popular tool in the Python um, community. Um, and I, I don't have, oh, I, I won't go into a lot of details here. I um, just wanted to share this because this is, this is popular. And another nice thing about this, um, which I, I didn't mention about MPI, but the MPI gives you a way of, of scaling out, not just within the server, the node, but beyond using multi-node parallelism. And so Dask also gives you a good way to scale out to multiple nodes as well. Um, and then there's there's also um, a lot of documentation with examples. There's a lot of different ways to use Dask. Um, and the documentation is pretty good though. It has a lot of examples and tips for performance. Um, another thing you should consider strongly, you probably already are if you're a, doing science in Python is, is doing array programming. But I wanted to call it out because it, it really is kind of the foundation of doing a lot of scientific um, data processing uh, with Python. Um, and um, it also, <clears throat> I guess I'll just show the next example here. So here I'm just kind of demonstrating what array programming is here. Um, um, here's a version of our simple example using array programming. So I've, I've redefined our estimate pi function um, here, but now we're, instead of using like a, a for loop, we're creating an array of, of random um, uniform um, samples. And then instead of, you know, looping through each of those uh, samples, we can uh, perform <laughs> array operations on those using the NumPy API. Um, and this gives us a way to kind of bypass the, that global interpreter lock because the num, NumPy is built on top of, um, of C and Fortran libraries. And so when you call these array vectorized operations, you're actually calling into code that's implemented in a lower level language like C or C++. And so you get C-like performance or Fortran-like performance um, when you use NumPy. So this is, this is incredibly useful. And you see that this is actually faster than and all of the previous examples combined, or not combined, but just all of the previous examples. But this also adds a little bit of um, a challenge here, uh, because now we actually have kind of multiple levels of parallelism to think about. So here's another example of using uh, the different example using NumPy, where we're, we're creating uh, a matrix, uh, thousand by a thousand, and then we're turning it into like it's just a random matrix, but we're turning it into a positive um, symmetric, positive different ma definite matrix. And I just want to um, kind of benchmark this eigenvalue decomposition function in in the NumPy API. Um, and so the bottom here, I'm just using a, a Python module that helps with some some benchmarking. It's not that big of a deal, but it takes about half a second to execute. Uh, to do perform this eigenvalue decomposition on this 1,000 by 1,000 matrix. Um, and so the NumPy 
code is calling into um, this lower level um, blast backend, um, which is typically something like OpenBLAST or Intel's MKL. And th those libraries use are multi-threaded. So here we're, we are using parallelism, but it's indirect. We're not really specifying it ourselves. Um, <clears throat> but that um, OpenMP runtime that's used by the, the backend in, in NumPy, um, it chooses at runtime how many threads it should use. So this is kind of something, this is something to think about when you're combining um, parallelism, uh, composing parallelism in, in Python is um, thinking about like how many, how much resources you're using and how composable are those different layers of, of, um, of parallelism. So here I kind of highlight on in, uh, in orange where the optimal number of threads that that runtime library should use um, to, to perform this operation is, is, act, is, is not the default value. And so here, what I'm doing is a scaling study where I explicitly limit that OpenMP runtime, how many threads it should use, and then run that benchmark um, to measure the performance. Um, and so this, this lets me kind of build an intuition of what the optimal number of threads I should let, um, let that piece of code have or specify for that piece of code. And I'll just point out, like by default, typically the, the, the OpenMP runtime will, will use um, We'll choose one thread per core. So, on pro on a Perlmutter CPU node, for example, that would be 128 um, threads, um, and that gives us a value that was close to that what, what I showed in the previous slide. Um, so that type of kind of scaling performance um, is a powerful tool for understanding. So, I kind of we started off with a single threaded um, example, and then I showed a couple of different. Um, ways of doing some sort of multi uh, parallelism, either multi-threading or multi-processing. Um, but I showed a, everything with an example of using like four threads or four processes. So when you want to understand the performance of your code, it's good to kind of do this, um, what, what we refer to as a, a scaling analysis, where you vary the number of processes or threads and kind of look at the behavior. So in this case here, I'm showing an example from, from code that I've worked on moving over to the GPU and then in the blue line kind of just show like the original CPU implementation and I measure the runtime of the, the whole program as I increase the number of tasks and it kind of go down it, it kind of goes down um, almost perfectly for a little bit but then it starts to kind of flatten out it's typically what we see as you increase the number of processes usually there's some overhead or communication or, or something that, that that kind of slows down performance you don't keep getting these perfect speed ups. Um, I think this is a really powerful tool while you're developing or moving things over to the GPU or something like that. Um, when you make changes to your code, uh, you might you change the performance at, at different scales of parallelism. So this is just an example illustrating that. Um, and here's a, here's another example where different I where I'm um, capturing the runtime of not just the, the total execution time of the program, but also measuring Kind of the specific steps that make up that program, um, and I just want to highlight one one thing here uh, is the there's the black the total line here, so it's going down for a little bit, and it, it kind of bottoms out around 32 or 64 tasks, and then at 128 it starts to dip back up, and you can see there's one one line that's really increasing throughout that whole time and that's the import section so here's an example where the import step in python you're just importing all the libraries that you're going to need at the top of your program as you add more and more tasks those are all separate processes that are doing a ton of um, file system operations and when you have too many of those things they start to, to collide with each other and Okay, so time check, 11.26. Yeah, so you've got about five or a bit more minutes because we started a bit late. Okay, so I'll just... Uh, also point towards a microphone when you're speaking, isn't it? Because <laughs> sometimes you're speaking away. Hard to see where I'm looking. 
Yeah, if you take a step back, maybe then the microphone. Anyway, it's good, but it's just occasionally if you face the other way. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit just to to because I want to cover using GPUs as well. Um, so yeah, I mentioned GPUs, and so just I also point out that just out of the box, you can't use the GPUs using NumPy or, or SciPy. They're not set up to to do any sort of computation on the GPU. There are many GPU frameworks that will give you access to the GPUs in Python. So some of those that kind of give you like a, a drop-in replacement for NumPy or SciPy, Pandas or Scikit-Learn are from something called KuPy, gives you like the, the NumPy API, but lets you use um, arrays that are stored in GPU memory. Um, and Rapids also provides things like, like Pandas and Scikit-Learn, um, but it, it runs that stuff on the GPU. There's also the machine learning um, libraries. Um, and a lot of those also do more than just machine learning. They also provide kind of array-like APIs and support general GPU computing. So it's like PyTorch, or TensorFlow, and, and JAX. And we have um, some talks later this afternoon about, about those. Um, and if you want to get into like more lower level um, GPU programming, there are a lot of options too, like uh, Numba, um, PyOpenCL, PyCUDA, and, and CUDA Python also um, give you ways to, to kind of dig a little deeper um, if, if you want to. Um, and then one of the challenges again with um, GPU program is you have four GPU, on Perlmutter GPU node, there are four GPUs. Um, so if you want to use all four of those, it's kind of like a similar challenge to um, scaling out to using multiple nodes in, in Python. So you kind of typically would need to combine some <clears throat> distributed memory um, parallelism um, with, um, with your GPU library of, of choice. So in work that I've done, I've used MPI um, plus like KuPy, for example, for, for multi-GPU, multi-node programming. You can also achieve something like that with, with Dask um, and even multiprocessing, but it, multiprocessing, but it's a little bit more work. Um, and then there are other options that are maybe a little bit more experimental like, like Coup Numeric, but it could be a, something to look at, keep, a, keep in mind in the future. Um, and I'll also just point out here at the bottom of this, I'm just kind of demonstrating there's, there's so many of these frameworks, it's kind of, um, almost a little messy, like trying to, you know, compose these or, or mix and match. Um, but there is an effort in the community to sort of, I mean, there's a recognition of this issue and the community is trying to standardize around a common Python array API. Um, and just to give you a little example of that, you could combine kind of writing like a low level CUDA kernel using Numba CUDA. Um, that's on the left. You can on the right. I have an example where you use the KuPy API to create an array on the on the GPU device. You could pass that to your Numba CUDA um, kernel, and then uh, when you get the result, you can you can use the NumPy API, and it still runs everything. It still performs that sum operation on the on the GPU. So there's there's no um, data movement back to the CPU in, the, in this example. Um, <clears throat> and then when you're we're thinking about which code should you move over to the GPU? So right now I imagine, you know, you're, if you've, <clears throat> you already have a, a, a code or application that's running on the CPU, you don't want to just move the whole thing over to the GPU in one go. You want to understand where the performance bottlenecks are of your current application and then figure out if you can get a speed up or, or, or get some performance benefit by moving that over to the GPU. Um, this is not, oh, you don't want to move everything over there because there's, there's an overhead to launching um, GPU uh, kernels. So here on the right, I have an example where we're just doing a, a dot product um, or a, a matrix multiplication, really, so two-dimensional arrays. And I have this XP random because I'm using either the NumPy API or the KuPy API. So in blue, you can see for small um, matrix sizes is, is, is NumPy here. We get very fast. This is a very fast operation until about a size of like 
20 or 30 or so. <clears throat> and then it, it jumps up to kind of taking about like a millisecond or, or beyond as we get, as we keep increasing the scale. Uh, if you compare that to, to Coupon, you can see that that uh, performance is really relatively flat. Um, and, but it, it's flat for a lot longer than the, the NumPy version. So after about, for matrix size about 20 or 30 or whatever, it is actually beneficial to do this operation on, on the GPU. Um, is that a one dimensional size there? Uh, uh, let's see. 10 to the two. Yes, yes. Yeah. So if your um, your algorithm or your code, if it's if it's if it's working with large arrays or matrices or, or images, those are good. You know, there's a good chance that you could see a speed up on the GPU. And another thing, if your application is already I/O bound, then you know you have to. Read all if your application already uh, if that's already the bottleneck then moving to the GPU is not going to fix your I/O I/O issue. Um, and then just kind of a, a thing to keep in mind: CPUs are are great; they're super fast um, for doing a, like a few operations, like a few things in in parallel. The GPUs are maybe a bit slower for like a single thread, but they have so many so many threads that it, it's a higher you get higher throughput with the GPUs. So just to kind of wrap up, I think you know one of the most powerful things you could do to improve the your your the performance of your code is to really like learn and and really um, become an expert at at array programming and NumPy and eliminate as many for loops in your program as as possible using kind of the vectorization and broadcasting and indexing features of of NumPy. I've helped a number of of users. Um, in my time here at NERSC and at various hackathons. And I think you, you, a lot of those are focused on, you know, how do we move stuff over the GPU? But I've seen so many times or even just removing Python for loops and using NumPy API is, is a huge benefit already. Um, and then with things like KuPy that lets you use the same exact API, but now on the GPU, you almost get all of that work of moving over to the GPU for free. Um, and then another thing to keep in mind when you start running at, at scale is that, you know, Python is a file system intensive language. And we see this a lot of the times as you increase your um, process um, count and the number of nodes that that file system startup becomes to be an issue. Um, so as, as Dan mentioned earlier, containers can help with this at larger scales. Um, but I will briefly, I'm going to go back all the way to the beginning really quick, just to point something out. Uh, so for this week scaling thing where I ran the DESI pipeline at all the way up to 1500 nodes on Perlmutter, you could see that the performance was pretty flat all the way out to about 300 or so ish nodes, then it starts to pick up. So when I ran this, I was running 32 tasks per, per node. So this is starting up, you know, tens of thousands of processes all at the same time. And I, I did not actually use a, a container for this. So at, at the time, um, you know, I was able to get pretty far without having to need this, but that, that tick up at the end really is just due to the startup time. So beyond a hundred ish node or 300 ish nodes, then that Python startup is really taking, um, you know, 15 minutes just for the application to start. Um, 